when it comes to the consideration of life, how do you establish value? Is it an inherent worth as a being created by God, or is life of relative value, determined by some measurement uh, related to one's level of contribution to society? And what's the difference, if anything, between intrinsic worth of a preborn baby compared to the functioning adult in the prime of life? Is there a standard to determine whether one's opinion or another opinion is morally right or wrong? And in the end, does it make any difference? Well, hello, I'm Sam Rohr, and I'll be joined today by Pastor Isaac Crockett. And our theme is this it's a matter of life or death. And as of the recording of this program, the new Biden administration has embarked on a complete overturning of entire national public policy in nearly every area, rejecting the policies of what's considered to be the most pro-life administration in the past generation, the Trump administration. And if the Biden administration's policies reflect their words, it will become the most anti-life and pro-death administration ever seen in our nation. Frankly, I am righteously angry as I see the changes. And I can say with certainty that God looks down at these changes and promises judgment, not blessing as a result. Our special guest today has been with us before, but we wanted him to join us again this year. His name is Scott Klusendorf, and he's the president and founder of Pro-Life Training Institute. A year ago, Scott, who is perhaps the nation's uh, most eloquent life apologist, was with us. Our theme then was in the defense of life. And in that part two part series, we answered the questions of why is the defense of life so important for the continuance of freedom and religious liberty in our nation? And why is the culture of death so destructive to freedom and religious liberty? In part two, we identified the cause for the rise of the death culture in America and the argument made for justifying abortion and legalized murder. We also dealt with solutions in that program for how a person can best dismantle and refute those arguments. And I encourage you to go back and watch these programs. On today's program, we'll answer the questions of why is life so important to the culture of freedom? Can we know the truth about what right and wrong is in regard to life? And is human value determined more by what we contribute to a society, or is it inherent? And we'll conclude next week in part two with answering the questions of why are the unborn often considered to be of less value than adults? And we'll consider the foundations of the worldview that leads to life and the worldview that leads to death. Let me invite in right now Scott Klusendorf, president and founder of Life Training Institute. Scott, welcome aboard. Thanks for being with us today. Good to be with you, Sam. Good to be with you, Isaac. Uh, Scott, let's start out right here at the beginning. I want to establish the basis for the program, and, and that is this. Why does a nation's culture and its uh, degree of civil freedom and its level and its view of uh, what is just or not just hinge on how that nation and its people deal with the matter of life? It's pretty fundamental. Tell us. Well, it's fundamental for this reason. Our founders recognized what they referred to as natural rights and liberties. Natural rights are those rights you have in virtue of your humanity. Government does not grant them. Government does not dictate them. Government's job is to respect those rights and make sure they are held up. And if you reject that premise that human beings have natural rights in virtue of their humanity, then all rights come strictly from the government, which means the same government that grants rights can take them away. The most fundamental of those natural rights, of course, is the right to life. And what that means is, is that government's job is to make sure that human beings are protected in law, that they are not unjustly given over to be killed. And if you remove the right to life, and you make that a matter of government utterance, where government is dictating who counts and who doesn't count as one of us, you've removed the foundation for all rights that would flow from your humanity. 
Uh, Scott, excellent, laying the foundation. The natural law, ladies and gentlemen, it comes from God. Our Declaration of Independence says it starts right out there. Our founders knew it. From God, life. When you come back, we're going to begin getting into the defense of life, the understanding of how Scott and his team actually present it to young people and others so critical to be understood. We'll be right back. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap, and today we are talking about a very serious matter. In fact, it's a matter of life and death. This is part one, a matter of life and death, part one. And Sam and I are talking with our good friend, Scott Klusendorf. And uh, Scott, you're um, the, the founder and president of Pro-Life Training Institute, and you take time to, to work with a lot of young people, especially to talk about these issues. And as you come to them as an apologist for, for life, uh, the, the interesting thing in the culture in which we live is that we have to define so many terms, but we actually are now defining not just what is right and what is wrong, but is there a right and is there a wrong? Can we have morality? Can there be, you know, this is good, this is bad? Can, can you kind of talk to us uh, what you find in your ministry as you're training young people, as you're trying to teach uh, young people just this basic foundational block about right or wrong? Yeah, since the Enlightenment, Isaac, there's been this notion that if you can't taste it, touch it, feel it, see it, or hear it, it's not real truth. It's just mere subjective passions. And of course, morals are not things you measure empirically. We know them through intuition, through direct awareness. And when we say morals are objective, what we mean is they're real and they're knowable. Our culture has largely rejected objective truth, except in one area, physics, the hard sciences. That's it. Anything related to religion, anything related to ethics is considered strictly subjective. And so you have a whole generation of students now that think moral truth is up to us. What's right for you may not be right for me. And by the way, don't judge me, because if you do, you're intolerant. Now, this turns the definition of tolerance on its head, uh, because the classical definition of tolerance was that I think you're mistaken, but I will tolerate you making the best case you can for your view. The new definition of tolerance says, no, don't you dare claim that your view is true, and especially don't you claim it's more true than my view because if you do, we're gonna cancel you. Now, this is the new reality of where we are, and we've got a whole new generation of students that have absorbed that worldview, which is at odds with true learning and odds with what we know as Christians, that moral truth is grounded in God's holy character. Uh, Scott, I wanna pick up on something. You said we have a whole generation of this going on. Uh, I'm, I'm in my late 30s, okay, and I have children going into middle school, and I've worked with high schoolers, I've worked in public schools, and I've worked on college campuses. Uh, but this, you said, also has been going on since the Enlightenment. So we really maybe it has been a decline maybe for multiple generations. Maybe that's a, a way of explaining it too. But right now, currently, in you know, the day and age in which we live, are you seeing differences? And maybe there's little nuances, but you know, with a high schooler versus you know, an older Gen Z who's in college versus maybe younger millennial to the, the older millennial, are, are, are you seeing a downward slope? Are you seeing differences within even just overall young people in, in the ministry training that you're doing? 
Yes, we are. And what the Enlightenment did, Sam and Isaac, is it put in place the foundation for our current epistemology, in other words, how we know things. The Enlightenment said to us, you can't know it unless it's empirically verifiable. And what we are seeing now is the full expression of that worldview that was really laid down as a foundation about 400 years ago. So now you get students who, if you ask them a very direct question, is rape wrong? Is murder wrong? Is lynching homosexuals for fun wrong? They'll say to you, well, it, it's, it's wrong for me, but I can't tell that other group over there that it's wrong for them. It might be right for them. Now, the difference is 20 years ago, if I asked somebody, is rape wrong? They would say yes. If I said to them, uh, is murder wrong? If I want to lynch somebody simply because I don't like their race, is that wrong? They would have said yes, and it would have caused them to question their relativism. Now what's happening is they're willing to bite the bullet and say, well, I personally feel it's wrong, but I can't say it's wrong for them. And what's happening is our moral intuitions are being eroded before our very eyes. And a lot of that has to do, I think, with churches in large not teaching moral theology to their parishioners. And as a result, we got people who have absorbed relativism. And, and Scott, that's a, I want to follow up on the question that Isaac said in your answer, and that is this. During your time of instructing young people, so let's just go there to the next generation, uh, who have not been hearing in church what you just said, they're certainly getting the opposite of it <clears throat> in any kind of their education. So when you come in and you say, all right, I want to talk to you about life, and we're going to, we're going to talk to you about this concept of um, truth, and you make a claim, well, there are some things that are always true, and there are some things that are always false. Okay, now, obviously, you've just explained that's a foreign thought. My question to you is, what is the response that you get? from young people when you introduce that new thought that <laughs> last generation was not new, but now it is. Are they responding with, hey, man, who are you? You're crazy. Or are they responding with more of a, you know what, that's, that's actually kind of a pleasant idea. What's the response? Uh, the latter. Uh, when we have a chance to make our case, students respond favorably. But it's important to know what we do to provoke that favorable response. We operate on the assumption that in a postmodern world like our own, where truth is reduced to individual language communities or individuals themselves, that we first have to reawaken people's moral intuitions before they'll accept our language of objective truth. So we show a short video clip, 55 seconds, that depicts abortion. That reawakens people's moral intuitions that right and wrong on the issue are real. Uh, you know, it's real hard to deny what the eye can, can pick up. And when you see pictures of Holocaust victims or children running naked from a village that's been napalmed in Vietnam or any other historical issue where we use imagery to convey truths that words alone are impossible to convey, people respond at a visceral level and it levels the playing field. Now we can talk about objective right and wrong because we first changed how they felt about the issue as a necessary predicate to changing how they think and ultimately behave. Then when we bring our facts and arguments, they're more receptive to them. And the number one thing we hear from students, Sam and Isaac, we've never heard arguments like this. We've never heard anybody lay out a case for the pro-life view. The problem isn't that the pro-life view has been tried and rejected. It's that it hasn't been heard in the first place. And, and, and I'm going to want to go in further with you about which, which you do first, introduce truth or introduce life. We'll go there next. But I want to go back to that question that you raised, because there are people watching right now who, um, um, well, they could be of all ages, but that point that you mentioned earlier, the concept that we now have, I think too many people share where they believe, well, I can believe that some things are right and some things are wrong, but that's personal. Um, and I don't have any right to project that position or to expect that that position is at all considered, let alone embraced, 
by anyone else, which then makes them shut their mouth and, uh, and, and keep it all kind of bottled up. How do you address that issue with people, that young people you talk with, who would understand that there's such things as truth, but they've been convinced that they got to keep it inside and it's only for them? Yeah, Sam, great question. One of the things we do is immediately help them understand that their own view is self-refuting. Uh, as soon as you say to somebody, you shouldn't judge anyone else, you just judged. You just judged everybody who holds a view that truth is real and knowable. You've basically said their view not only doesn't count, it's evil. That's making a moral judgment. It's kind of like saying, uh, my brother is an only child, or I can't speak a word in English, or you're in rare form as usual. As soon as you say something like those sentences, those sentences are false on the face of it because they refute themselves in the mere utterance of them. In the same way, when you say to someone, you shouldn't judge, or who are you to impose your morals on me, you just imposed a moral rule on people. So helping people see that the relativistic worldview is inherently self-refuting is often the first step to helping them understand that you're not being unreasonable to argue for moral truth. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you're hearing what Scott is saying here right now, because we're all this, we're talking about life, but there are so many more issues even beyond life. The ability to be able to say there is a position that never changes and not be afraid to go that, yeah, God is the one who established that. And you know, the, the Bible is the one that give, is the place that gives us that truth. Don't be afraid to go there. That's powerful. That is our anchor when it comes to the matter of truth. Now, Scott, I'm going to go back to you right now. Um, and that is this, when, when you are presenting the concept of, um, of uh, life, and the intrinsic value of life, and you started out by talking about God created natural law, so let's just put it together. When, when you present this to young people who basically are, as you said, many say, are hearing it for the first time, just out of curiosity, um, do you introduce the concept of absolute truth first, the concept that there are some things true or always true, or do you start with the fact of life and the value of life first, and then go to truth. How, how do you do it? Yeah, we do the latter. We start with life and then argue that relativism is an inappropriate, insufficient way to respond to the arguments we've made. And we do life first because we can use the imagery to uh, reawaken their moral intuitions in the first place. And then we lay out a logical, scientific, and philosophical case for the pro-life view. We argue from science that the unborn are distinct living whole human beings. And we argue philosophically that there's no essential difference between you, the embryo, and you, the young adult, that would justify killing you back then. Once we make that case, we then address the five bad ways people typically respond to that case, one of which is they respond with relativism. They confuse moral claims with preference claims. And what we find out, Sam, is that when we take time to identify and refute relativism, students begin to understand. They begin to see that the relativistic worldview is not sustainable. It doesn't work because everybody makes moral judgments. There's no way to escape it. Relativists think that non-relativists are mistaken. They think we're wrong. They're making a judgment. And if we expose that and basically show that the emperor has no clothes on this, uh, the students get it. And one last question before we move to the break. Are you finding in your young people, are you talking to folks, the young people who have had some Bible training, some understanding of God, or are you talking about those who don't have any understanding, and are you seeing any kind of a difference in those two groups as you talk with them? Uh, we speak to both. Uh, we speak sometimes in large Catholic high schools where maybe we're talking to 1,800 students at one time, and a, a large number of those students have had no biblical worldview training, so to speak. They're simply in a private school because their parents don't want them in a public school. Uh, then we speak to kids that have been at some level exposed to biblical teaching, but almost all of them it's inadequate. They haven't fully understood the nature of moral reasoning. 
And even among the kids that come out of churches that we would consider to be fairly well-grounded churches, we will get things like this. They'll say, well, uh, I get it that abortion's bad, but what about, you know, that 15-year-old girl that's been raped? Or what about that 15-year-old girl whose boyfriend's rejected her? I mean, it may not be right for her to be forced to have a baby she can't afford. And they end up punting to relativism. And that's why apologetics training, that's why helping students understand that the biblical worldview can compete in the marketplace of the ideas if it's properly understood and properly articulated is so crucial, Sam. It is crucial. Uh, Scott, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to come back and we're going to both wrap it up and give you a preview for next week in part two. We'll be right back. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap as we talk about the first part of this program, uh, a matter of life or death. And then next week we're going to have part two of this. So we're talking with uh, Scott Klusendorf from, uh, 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 see, so you're the president and founder of the Pro-Life Training Institute, your website ProLifeTraining.com. And, and you especially are focused in on young people, um, high school age and things like that oftentimes. And we've been talking about just this moral relativism, this, you know, just starting with certain standards, like there is right and there is wrong, you know. But uh, next week we want to get into the, kind of dig deeper into this, the value of human life. Uh, Scott, could you maybe just kind of introduce that in a real short way, kind of maybe what are the perspectives on, on valuing or devaluing human life? There are two major positions you can hold on the question of human value, and you have to pick one. The first view is what we call the endowment view. Humans have value simply because they're endowed by their creator uh, with certain rights, fundamental, what we call natural rights, which includes the right to life. In other words, on the endowment view, Isaac, you are not valuable because of some function you can perform, like having an adequate level of self-awareness or the ability to feel pain or seeing yourself existing over time. Rather, you have what we call intrinsic value simply because you're a human being. The performance view, which is the rival view to the endowment view, says that no, being human is nothing special whatsoever. In fact, to claim that being human is special is speciesism, which is akin to racism. And rather, what gives you your value is being a person. And to be a person, you have to have self-awareness, cognitive ability is at a sufficient level. And until you have those things, you do not have value. And as we'll talk about uh, in a future segment, this leads to savage inequality. And it's a horrific view with dangerous ramifications for all of us in society. And Scott, you've set us up uh, real, really well at that point. Again, you said the endowment view intrinsic value comes from our Creator God, natural law, we can see it. And that stands in sharp contrast to what you're saying is the performance view. And I tell you, a lot of people have probably never thought about it quite like that, but when you say it, the endowment view, think about that, ladies and gentlemen. Do you believe that life and all life has its value intrinsically, not because of the color of its skin, the place of birth, the gender, but because it was there by God's creation, or do you think it's based on something that uh, we have to do? Major difference. We'll go into more of that in next week's Part 2 program. Well, thanks for being with us today. It's, uh, it's always an honor for us to be, be with you in your home, and it's so good to hear from so many of you uh, who this program is a major part uh, of your weekly viewing. 
let us know that you are watching. Um, contact us. That information will be on the screen at the close. Uh, consider partnering with us in prayer. We need your prayer. This program is unique. It's all over the country. We're hearing from people all over the country on this program, and we pray that it's benefiting you. If it is, let us know and partner with us in prayer. Partner with us in finances as well. That is also very important that we can continue to take and expand and put this kind of truth across the nation. Again, this program is part one. Enjoy it. Listen to it again. Join us next week.